Welcome to the Bobble On Podcast, where we're committed to providing practical advice and strategies to increase your revenue, unify your team, and create accountability throughout your organization. Let's go. All right. Man, ZB knows how to get us fired up. I know. For those of you who are not watching, you should be. But if you're not and you're just listening, ZG and I both have a copy of Extreme Ownership, a book that we want to talk about today. ZG, tell them why we're going to talk about this book. It's because of your feedback. Yeah. And uh, I try to do that in my own Jocko voice. In very like extreme. Military. Yeah. Very extreme. So thank you for the feedback on Radical Candor. Matt and I absolutely adore that book. It is our most recommended book to teams. To teams. Uh, yeah. By far. Uh, now, we thought, like, People give us feedback about what else do you read? We'd love to see more book reviews. And we're committed to you to do at least four next year. Maybe like one a quarter, we'll go through it. But the one that just jumped at us, like you said, was Extreme Ownership. It is one of the most impactful books that we've read that transcended business into personal. Yeah, written by Jocko Willink, who is a uh, ex-Navy SEAL. Um, he's done a great job. He has an awesome TED Talk that kind of captures this book in 12 minutes or so. Um, but he, he, he's, he's done a lot of articles. He's been on a lot of podcasts. One of the number one podcasts out there is his. Yeah. So Ridiculously a lot of people good. know about him. Ridiculously but, good. But the great thing about this book is, for both of us is, as you said, you could implement these strategies immediately at, on a professional level and get, get really good input and, and, and feedback from it, but also on the personal side. And I think that going into the new year, everyone should be in the right mindset heading into 2020. And if there's one book to read to get you in the right mindset, it's this book. Amen. We can't start like that, though. We got <laughs> we got to do some personal best, baby. What do you got for me? So uh, my personal best from the last week uh, incorporated a visit to a local nightclub. Go on. Yep. And uh, specifically, the nightclub is called Flight Club, as in like you're flying, Flight Club. And I thought it was a playoff of Fight Club, but actually it's Flight Club as in like darts flying through the air. Ooh. So this dart club or dart bar, whatever you want to call it, um, opened up across the street from us. And it is fully decked out with electronic dart boards. Not like hmm. the actual, but it's actual like, a, I don't know, it's the normal dart board, but it has an electronic reading on it. Oh, it's like so, a simulator. A simulator. So you oh. basically don't have to uh, to record anything. Easy clean It's up. just like bowling. Yeah, easy. It's like bowling, but, mm. uh, but it, so you don't have to like keep track of anything. It, it, it tallies exactly how you're doing. Huh. And you go and go with three, four, five people. Mm. I went with Sadie and Parker. Mm. I had Parker on my chest and we, we had a couple drinks. Mm. Uh, with our friend, we played darts all night. It was awesome. Huh. The whole place is decked out in like 1940s drab. It's like oh, such a cool scene. Um, Did you dress Parker up? No, no. He couldn't see him. He was in that like carry case oh, in my chest. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. But, uh, but he was warm by the end of the night. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all. how'd you do? I won. Yeah. Yeah. But it was really fun. Sadie mm. did an amazing job. Mm. Uh, our friend Kate won a couple games as well. Mm. So we had a great time. Mm. Sadie, great job coming in second. <laughs> she did. Uh, no, that, that's really cool. What a cool idea. Yeah. It's called Super. Flight Club. And uh, I don't know if they're around the country, but it's yeah. such a cool place. Because like, unlike bowling, it's a lot more social. You're standing up the whole time. Mm. And after you're done with your turn, you're up again in like 30 seconds. Mm. You don't have to wait four or five, ten minutes. Mm. You have to rent someone's sweaty shoes. You just pick up darts and throw them at a board. Some bad memories of bowling, it sounds like. <laughs> but that's cool. I, I can't wait to try it. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It'd be a fun, uh, fun bonding team bonding event or something for the for the crew, yeah. i.e., you and me and anyone else. I was going to say, I was, it was that a way of in, avoiding inviting me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Yeah, it'll be fun. You, cool. You're you're good at darts. I've uh, I've, I've I've witnessed. I've a, been known to throw. I've. <laughs> is that what they say? <laughs> I don't know. Idea. The lingo. <laughs> no, well, that's cool. Moving on to your personal. Yeah, um, personal best in the last week. Uh, you know, we had a. Uh, we had a lot of good like, kind of family realizations. It's been like a really kind of fun family week. We had an, you and I had an empty weekend, which by itself is just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, my personal best was actually KG set up 
gingerbread houses for uh, Mason and Emma and just kind of like watching them make the gingerbread houses, have fun, get their hands dirty. And Mason was just so excited and Emma was so excited to actually build it. And then at the end, like Emma like looked at me and was like, can we, can we eat these? And I was like, yeah, you could do whatever you want. It was just like a family experience. And that's cool. You know, growing up Jewish, like I didn't really do mo- most of these things. So it's really cool to like mm. raise them to be able to like kind of like do these kind of habits and just have fun with it. Mm. And it was awesome. I ate a ton of marshmallows. I bet. A ton. That's the best part. Oh my God. It's amazing. Wait, did you guys have gumdrops? Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Sprinkles? Yes. And frosting because that's the glue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of frosting. The, um, the sprinkles were... Um, the round kind that like bounce, you know, mm. I don't know how to describe it better than that, but they're almost like little tiny little uh, balls. Pellets. Yeah. So like Emma was just like, bum, 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 bum. she was like, oh, that's funny. Bum, 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 oh, bum. No. She was like, well, yeah. So there was a lot of cleanup. You'll be finding those in July. Yeah. Well, Kenzie uh, cl- cleaned as many up as oh. she could find. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was super fun. It was a cool experience. And actually just seeing KG like set the whole thing up for the kids and the kids were just so excited. Yeah. So that was, that was the best moment of the weekend by far. Cool. Um, so let us talk about Jocko. What an amazing human being. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, to all of those out there who have served or know someone who served, I mean, thank you for your service, part one. I mean, th- just reading this book and he gives um, military experience, business experience, personal experience. Mm-hmm. It's beautifully written. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can just, it's just layered with so much gratitude. You can just know the sacrifice they've made. Uh, it's pretty fun. I mean, one of his, uh, you know, uh, we'll, uh, we're going to dive into a couple of our main takeaways that, mm. you know, if you're not going to read, you should read the entire book, but if you're not going to, these are some main takeaways you can go implement tomorrow yes. at, at professionally and personally. Um, the, I mean, it, the main takeaway is the name of the book, Extreme yes. Ownership. So th- we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but basically just taking 100% responsibility for everything. Mm-hmm. Whether or not you think that you could have had an impact, you you are the one that owns it. There's yeah. no excuses. I love that. But I love the fact that he used his military experience and some of the stories yes. and then and then brought it back. And, you know, the one that, that stuck, st- stood, out, stood out the most for me was when he was talking about, you know, uh, the blue on blue, which I didn't know, but blue on blue meaning like friendly fire. And they were in Iraq and his, he was leading the team and they started firing at each other. Mm. And there was a casualty, an Iraqi, Iraqi soldier, there was a casualty. And, uh, and afterwards, like there was, they did the full investigation and a lot of people were like, realized that like there were a ton of mistakes made by everyone. But ultimately he came to the table and said, this was fully my fault. It was mm. all on me. I take full responsibility. Mm. And as a result, the leaders, you know, respected him more and his yeah. team respected him more. It's a, it's a, that's a beautiful story. I, I loved when he went through that. And to clarify on Matt's point there about extreme ownership is Jocko is extraordinarily detailed and you cannot just take responsibility and say, it's my fault if you don't actually believe it. Right. And that was one of his biggest points throughout the book that I took as well is there's saying, ah, it's my fault. And there's actually believing it's your fault. They're different things. Mm -hmm. Just because you happen to be the CEO, the manager, the leader, you can't just say, ah, it's my fault. Don't worry about it, Jill. Or don't worry about it, Sally. Don't worry about it, Greg. I got this. It's my fault. You have to actually own it, like Jocko said, and really take responsibility. Explain why it's your fault. Explain what you could have done better. And then people will believe you Mm. as opposed to just saying. Yeah. It's on me. Well, I think there's a lot of professionals in a leadership position who read somewhere that they should take it. They should take ownership over Mm -hmm. mistakes their team makes because it's the right thing that a leader should do. And then there's those who actually believe it, as you said. And so there's a huge distinction between Mm -hmm. those two. You know, we love to relate it to golf. And there was a uh, golfer named Paul Casey. I remember this is there was a clip that went viral this year. And he had a call at 200 yards out. His caddy gave him a three iron when it should have been a four iron. And he, or maybe a four iron instead of a five iron. Anyways, he hits the ball. It's going right at the flag. And he's admiring, he's posing. It flew maybe 30 yards over and like went into the grandstands. Mm-hmm. And the, the way Paul Casey handled it is exactly what, how Jocko would, he like turned around and he just smiled. And him and his caddy just started laughing. And they just started laughing. It's a major tournament. It's a big, big, mm-hmm. big, big, big mistake. And they're walking up to the hole laughing. And they asked Paul Casey after the round, like, why, why are you laughing? Like, and he said, you know what? Like, 
I can't remember the last time like I didn't check the club and just see which club you gave the cat my caddy gave me. Mm-hmm. I didn't check it. It was the wrong club. It's my fault. Yeah. That's it. That's taking ownership. Yeah. As opposed to we know plenty of other golfers are look at the caddy and be like, Oh yeah, what MF doing? him. What are you doing? Yeah. You have one job. Give me the right club. Right. No, he didn't take that approach. Yeah. Took extreme ownership. Yeah. I'd want a caddy for him. Yeah. Yeah. All day. Yeah. I think the, uh, the that story is a great reflection in, in a in a you know mm. um, in an environment where a lot of eyes are on you and you you have you know one of two different ways to point. to react. Um, and a lot of times you don't have a lot, of, a lot of eyes on you as a leader. Mm. And you might just be one-on-one or with a group of three people. Your team might be only five people deep. Yeah. And they're looking to you to be strong and solid. And if you defray or deflect any uh, responsibility or blame on uh, onto others, it's really, mm. uh, it's something you can't get back. No. It deteriorates. And unless you work on that for years, you really have a tough time getting that back. It's, yeah, trust is built, right? And this is, Jocko talks about one of the biggest ways to build trust is by taking ownership, believing it, making changes and what have you. Yeah. And, um, and, he, and he brought up um, a large part about ego uh, in the book, which expand on that. Expand on what your takeaway was about, uh, about checking your ego. Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty simple, but it's, it's, it's somewhat relatable to what we were just talking about mm. in that a lot of times leaders don't want to take responsibility if, if in reality one of their reports or people that, you know, employees or team members made a mistake that they've expressed exactly how to do it in the past mm. and they still made a mistake. And it's easy to just say, hey, you know, that's, that's on you, that's not on me, do it better the next time or this person, you know, did X, Y, Z and that's why we didn't accomplish our goal. And I think to check your ego really means like, Still, you take criticism. Like, take it on yourself. Don't, mm. don't actually, uh, you know, push that blame onto anyone else. Even mm. if you do feel like it's someone else's mm. fault, mm. you know, it, ultimately, it's it rolls up to you because mm. you're the one in charge. We've we've seen a lot of people bring up this exact same point in a different way, and what they're trying to say is, there's a difference between being the best and trying to be better. And if you already think you're the best, that's the definition of what Jocko is saying is you already have an ego. Where if you think there's room to get better, which Jocko is clearly arguing in, in this book, you pr- this book will probably make a lot of, you, you'll flow through this book if you think there's better. If you think that you're the best, this book isn't for you. Because mm-hmm. you, you will have an ego. You can't check it. Yeah. You know, you, you already think you're, you're a master. Yeah. 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 If you walk into a room and, and it, it requires you to be, humble and show some humility if you're taking on the blame that might not be a direct mistake you made mm. it takes a lot of humility to do that and ownership mm. and uh it, it speaks volumes to your team but it also like it provides you a ton of control mm. and I, that's one of the th- un, unstated sort of takeaways that i got too is that if you don't take a total ownership over mistakes your team make or m- mistakes that happened you're not. You're relinquishing control to to the arbitrary. You're relinquishing control of things that you can't control. Mm. You know. You're basically saying like, "Hey, things are going to happen in the future. It's not yeah. going to be my fault." How insurance owners can, can and people in leadership positions can take away from this is, you know, you and I started GNN. Okay, we started from scratch. We did every single position available. Um, it is very easy to have an ego when you do that, um, because you think that you're probably above that because you've been kind of gradually going along the way. Like I. I I don't need to be at the front anymore. I don't need to do service anymore. I don't need to do sales and just kind of go. And his point is to, to really, really, really make sure you keep your ego in check. And if you are the leader of the organization and something happens in service, it is still your fault, even though you're not actually doing the service. Mm. But if you don't check your ego, you will think it's somebody else's fault. Right. Because you're not doing it. Right. Um, but you haven't set them up. Right. Um, the other, the other, uh, the other item that we chatted about earlier that you kind of brought up as one of your main takeaways was like, there's no bad teams. There's only mm. bad leaders. Maybe you can yeah. elaborate on that. It, it, it's something that um, I I just feel like it's a staple. It is a staple. And how he said it about there are no bad teams. I know in in my um, in my work career, I've viewed teams as bad in the past. 
like when I was uh, earlier on at whether BJ's Wholesale Club or whether I was you know working at Enterprise or Food Tester, all the way up there in every organization in America, they almost look at like one team's better than the other, mm -hmm. right? And what Jocko is getting at is that no, it, it's just a leadership problem. Mm -hmm. The people are good, you know, people are going to try, but they need a leader behind them. It's not a bad team. It's the person on top, and the team is good. Mm -hmm. And that's what I took away from it. And it was a, it was a beautifully well-written chapter. Yeah, and I think a lot of people could, could argue against that by saying, you know, everyone has different skill sets. Some people are better at certain things than others. Like, why, what, you know, what do you mean by that? And his, I think his main, his main point there was, if you believe that mm. it truly is on you as the leader, you're going to get the best out of everyone on your team. It doesn't mean that everyone on the team is going to be equal in their capacity and skill yeah. set and productivity, but ultimately you're going to get the best out of them because mm. that you believe it's all on you. Mm. And you're going to, they're going to see that and they're going to rise to the occasion mm. opposed to feeling like they're under the thumb. And, and he, he wrote, wrote it correctly in that um, he's not saying you can't let somebody go. He's not saying you, you have perfect people on the team and someone can keep screwing up and you just keep taking the blame. But he's saying as teams, as groups of individuals, they're going to be great. They're great, good teams. There's no bad teams. Because mm -hmm. if you have a bad player on your team, or actually to rephrase it, if you have all bad people on the team, get rid of them all. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's your job as a leader to develop the right team. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love that. I love how he just kept going back to Almost everything is solvable uh, if you believe it's solvable and you believe it's your fault. Nothing is solvable if you believe it's somebody else's fault. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, another point that I really liked in this book, um, again, personal as well as professional takeaways, is his uh, understanding of the prioritization and execution. Mm -hmm. How you have to take a look um, as a leader, as a, as a husband, as a dad, as you and I all are, like, it is so easy to have 9,000 things. Heaven forbid you have hobbies and friends. You know, like it's so easy to have so many things in your list. But his way of taking a, a list of prioritization and execution works everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it is easy to look at him and say, well, you have military background. And it must be easier for you to compartmentalize and do that. No, he breaks it down and says, no, this is really easy. You list out everything you have to do you prioritize, and then you execute. Mm -hmm. I love how simple he made that. Yeah, you know, the whole time reading that chapter, I was thinking about how we really advise a lot of our Bob Long clients during this, you know, using the system that we have in place to help identify their issues. And then when it comes time to resolve and execute on the solution, mm. you go towards the hairiest one. You yeah. go to, you start with the biggest problem. And that way, if you get to the end of the day, or get to the end of the meeting, and you don't have enough time, at least you didn't leave the biggest one that's going to take the most amount of energy and resources mm. to the end. Mm. And I, I think that's, mm. you know. It's, it's spot on. He, he personally, I, I've heard him talk about this in podcasts, Jocko uh, always has a book he's writing. That's his thing now. He always wants to be writing a book. And this is a beautiful way of prioritization and execution. What he says is it takes about 100,000 words to, to write a book, 80 to 100,000 words. Okay, if you, there are plenty of people out there who could take nine hours per day and write a book. They could just, but he knows he's got multiple businesses, he has four kids, he's got stuff going on. So what does he do? Every single day, he wants to write 1,000 words. That's it. And that way in 100 days, the book's finished. Mm -hmm. But you can't write a book in 100 days if you don't write 1,000 words a day. Mm -hmm. So his way of prioritizing is saying that's the most important thing. So what's the very first thing he does every day? Mm -hmm. so he writes 1,000 words. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And then that's how he churns out books every year. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people are like, well, how do you find the time to write books? Well, I prioritize and execute. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, he's definitely a maximizer. It gets a lot out of the week. Yeah, simple. The, uh, the, other, the other point, one of the chapters he, he talked about was the importance of decentralized command, mm. which was... Uh, you know, it's obvious in a military scenario, like if you had one person that made all the decisions and everyone else couldn't make decisions unless it was up to them and all ran up, the accountability all ran up to one person. It's a very highly dysfunctional and actually unsafe, very dangerous situation because you need to make decisions quickly 
And whether they're the right ones or not, you need to know exactly who's making that decision. Mm. And the decentralized command, um, you know, that he has, obviously you have different leaders and different officers and different, you know, that leads different troops and groups. And uh, same thing in a professional environment. Like, you know, we talk about all the time, all the time. need for having ownership in different compartments, different departments, different, you know, teams within mm. an organization and why that's so important. It's mm. for efficiency. It's for making quick decisions, but mm. also for your team to know who do I turn to when mm. I need the help that I need. Yeah. And as you brought up early on about uh, checking your ego at the door, if you want to instill decentralized command, you cannot do it if you have an ego. Mm -hmm. You know that he really tied that back in as like this is an overall point with no ego. Decentralized command is easy because you can rely on other people to execute. But if you have an ego, decentralized command goes nowhere because then it all comes back to you. Mm -hmm. And insurance agent owners need to hear that over and over and over. You need to give people position so that I can actually take things to the end and then execute, mm -hmm. which is decentralized command. Yeah. Yeah. And too often we, we put someone in a position of power or a position of leadership or management, and then we still don't let them finish it or they, ha they can't finish it without our approval. And so they get 80% of the way and they, then they realize I actually don't have any, I'm just doing tasks. I'm just completing to-dos. I'm completing your to-do list. Right. Yeah, it's no good. L last point that for my takeaway that I really wanted to bring up was his uh, method of keeping things simple. Mm -hmm. And people need to hear this over and over. We, we just... We have a hard time communicating our ideas down the chain or up. And a lot of times it's because there's this lengthy story. There is 17 things that have to happen. Well, his idea is simple ideas get spread, complex ideas get buried. Mm -hmm. If you keep things super simple in his way, the people it saves lives. If you're on the battlefield and everything's simple, good things happen. If you're on the battlefield and it needs to be explained and there's 45 different variables, doesn't work. Yeah. It's the same thing. We sell insurance, guys. This doesn't need to be complicated. Let's keep it super simple. Well, everywhere from marketing messages to the to outside uh, and then decisions and cascades internally. I think that he related a lot more to the internal cascades yes. because if you know you have a general that makes a decision that that rec that could like the old school telephone game in middle school or elementary school. It's probably elementary school, not middle school. Uh, maybe we, we were still playing in middle school. But in elementary school, you're playing telephone. Yeah. One person says to another person, then they have to report it down. And like mm. the message is so mm. deteriorated and different at the very end. Mm. It's because it's a full sentence and it's a lot of complexity to it. And the same thing happens. And God forbid you have to you know, turn around to three different people and say mm. the same thing. And then troops are going in different directions. And same thing in professional and even more so sometimes in a professional environment mm. you know, where people take a certain message and they, and they warp it. They change it. And... If it's, if it's not simple, it's really challenging to kind of... Yeah, simple ideas spread internally. And a great simple thing that you should have is your mission statement, your core values, um, you know, your, the basic sales process you want to get done. Your processes should be simple. We teach that at Babylon. Plenty of other people teach that and how they lead and manage. And Jocko writes it in a beautiful way. Yeah. And so the book is Extreme Ownership. It's, a, it's an awesome book. There are so many different ways to consume it. You can consume it by podcast. You can consume it by TED Talk. You can Audible's great. It's in his voice. Mm -hmm. And actually, we should mention it's by it's by Leif Babin as well as Jocko. Jocko just is a the much bigger voice, but Leif wrote it with Jocko. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Leif. That's okay. He he might not be listening yet, but we would recommend that you consider not just reading it yourself at, or with the leadership team that you might be part of, but. Having the entire organization read it. Mm. If you have 30 people, have 30 people read it. Or buy Audible or you know, share it in CD format, whatever, if you still listen to CDs. But if you have a team of five, every, everyone should read it. Why? Even if someone who just joined the team and maybe they're in an entry-level position, it helps them to take ownership over their job. I mean, it's only making everyone's job easier if they were all living by these principles. What a beautiful office it would be if it was like, it's my fault. The person's like, no, 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 it's my I'm like, no, no, no. You don't take my fault. Yeah. Like that's a beautiful organization because they actually truly believe that they can be better. Yeah. It seems like everyone should read it. One of our Babylon clients, uh, they're, they're one of their core values are we're thumb pointers. Mm. And uh, I love that. That's when I, th when I heard them say yeah, we're thumb pointers, I thought of this book and I was like, oh. W what does it mean by thumb pointer? Meaning that it's, not, not, it's never your fault uh. pointing. It's always my fault. Like, the, like the, it's all on me. It's I never like on any. That. that way you can never blame anyone else for thumb pointers. Huh. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. I'm a finger pointer. <laughs> <laughs> no, Books Extreme Ownership. 
pick it up. Tell us also, more importantly, tell us how this podcast is because we're committed to do a couple more book reviews in 2020 um, due to your feedback on Radical Candor. This is our second one, Extreme Ownership. We want to give you books that you could take in, in a business setting, but also take in a personal setting. And this one check, checks the box. Babylon moves forward and wishes everyone a happy holiday. Babylon. Babylon. Happy Festivus.